So I guess everyone is here uh, and, uh, and YouTube is working as well. So good night for everyone. Um, you know, on, on behalf of, of SEB and Institute Camino do Meio, we are starting this uh, second edition of, uh, of this SEB Talk series. Uh, boa noite para todo mundo. A gente está começando então a nossa segunda edição dessa série de, de falas. É, antes de começar, eu vou pedir para a Poliana passar uns recados técnicos para quem, especialmente quem precisa de tradução, para todo mundo se orientar aí. Boa noite, boa noite a todas, a todos. É, então, para quem precisar é, de tradução, tem um botão na barra inferior é, com um globo. Nesse... Com esse, daí você pode clicar nesse botãozinho e vai aparecer a instrução, a opção de você utilizar para você habilitar o idioma de português. Se você quiser é, ficar com a voz da Roche Halifax de fundo, você não desabilita o, o áudio original. Se você quiser ficar só, apenas com a tradução, então você a, a, aciona essa opção. No celular, esse botão ele vai ficar é, escondido em três pontinhos. Nesses três pontinhos na barra inferior, vai estar vai a opção do Interpretation, e aí você faz a mesma coisa, seleciona o idioma português e ativa a tradução. Obrigada, boa noite. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. From here on out, uh, we'll be in two languages. We'll be here in English, and then Polly just described how to do uh, Portuguese through the Interpretation button. If you have any questions uh, further about the interpretation button, please just write in the chat and uh, Polly will help you with that. Se alguém tem algumas perguntas mais sobre como entrar no português, só so, uh, so entrar no chat e a uh, Polly vai ajudar você a uh, uh, ouvir em português. So it is my great pleasure to welcome everybody to the second SEBI Talks. And uh, SEBI Talks are short, powerful talks which expand horizon. And this is our first series, Interconnection, Community and Global Transformation. And we are thrilled to welcome Roshi Joan Halifax, who will uh, give us not only the second SEBI talks of this series, but the second SEBI talks ever. So uh, thank you so much, Roshi <laughs> Halifax. Thank and you, Andreas. The <clears throat> and the title of our talk today will be At the Edge, Transforming Moral Suffering. And before I, I give Roshi a full introduction, that um, we all know that an event like this takes a lot of people. And so it seems like a pretty simple Zoom event, but so many people were involved. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to really thank Bruno Morcino, who's doing the uh, simultaneous translation for us. Without his uh, mm -hmm. efforts, this event would not be possible. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Bruno Lastorina, Leah Beltrone, and Pauli Zoc, who formed uh, the, the crew here to, uh, at the Center of Making Things Happen on this side. Erupaya, there was uh, Joel uh, Vilaseca and Wendy Lau, and I'm sure many other people who uh, we're not aware of who uh, were able to connect us uh, today. And um, we also have uh, Gaston Sanchi Bañez who did the wonderful graphic design for us. And of course, uh, we'd all like to thank Lama Padma Santam for hosting the event and, uh, and making this event possible. So with that, um, you may not believe me, but uh, it turns out that uh, Roshi Halifax has a book uh, coming out in Portuguese, I think this month. And we weren't even aware of that when we uh, arranged this event. It's coming out on Lucinda Letras. And so uh, um, I'll, I'll ask Polly to at some point, perhaps uh, write some more information in the chat if you'd like to have access to Roshi Halifax's more recent work in Portuguese. And uh, as a quick overview for today, we're, we have a, a little more of a concise uh, evening. We have one hour together and we're gonna jump in momentarily and uh, with Roshi Halifax and following her 20 minute SEBI talk, 
uh, Lama Padma Santam will lead a dis or will uh, ask her some questions and have a conversation and uh, hopefully open up some of the things that she's able to uh, share with us in such a short talk. And that will be it for uh, the evening tonight. So we're going to end uh, right at right at the hour. So moving right into the talk, it, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ro uh, Roshi Halifax and uh, to give her a proper introduction, it would actually take the full hour. But uh, she's been a pioneer of so many fields and so many things from the 1960s into the present. So I'll just touch on a few highlights that uh, perhaps uh, today, one of the things she's best known for is being the abbot of the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico which over many years has built up the capacity to really be a node of, uh, of Buddhism, I think not only in the, uh, in the Western world, but uh, in, in the world in general. And, uh, but in addition to her, uh, her work directly with Zen, she's been a long-term long -term civil rights and environmental activist. She's been a pioneer in end-of-life care. And uh, really there's so, so many other things I'm, I'm not going to uh, go on. And uh, so with that, it's uh, my great pleasure to invite Roshi Halifax to please go ahead and present At the Edge, Transforming Moral Suffering. Welcome. Thank, thank you so much, Andreas. And I want to thank your community for the honor of sharing a little bit of my perspective about the relationship between integrity and moral suffering. And integrity is an extraordinarily important value and virtue in today's world, a world where we see corruption in politics, we see corruption in education, medicine, and also in, in religion. And we know that um, uh, when there is this kind of suffering, because corruption is suffering, um, our uh, uh, integrity is compromised and so also uh, is our freedom compromised. But I want to begin by saying I'm you know, nowhere near a, a moral philosopher, but as a long-term Buddhist practitioner in looking at the power of uh, the precepts of sila, samadhi, prajna, mm -hmm. if, you know, what it means to be a Buddha, what it means to be a bodhisattva, um, and how important it is to cultivate integrity in the world today, in our lives. But it is, you know, actually been that way, if you will, since uh, human beings evolved. And investigating the nature of integrity and um, uh, looking at uh, ethics and morality in the individual experience and in our collective experience has been something that I've, I've spent a lot of time on over the years. You know, um, in a former incarnation, earlier in my life, I, I was an anthropologist and I discovered that there are many different moral platforms and the notion of what is right and wrong can vary from culture to culture and also can vary uh, extremely from individual to individual. So I asked myself mm -hmm. the question, you know, what is integrity? And what I realized that um, the most keen way to understand integrity um, really has to do with looking through the lens of suffering. You know, when we cause suffering to others or we cause suffering to ourselves, our integrity is violated. And I want to look at some of the ways in which our integrity is violated and how to you know, heal that process. And when we alleviate the suffering of others or when we operate or live <clears throat> by vow, we live a life that um, is upright, um, our integrity is affirmed. So, you know, our values are reflected in our character and um, they are what basically affirm or destroy our integrity. And I've written in many places, without uh, integrity, our freedom is compromised. And I'm speaking not just about social freedom, I'm talking about our internal freedom as well. A lot of times we're speaking about it in terms of issues 
uh, related to structural violence, but also um, we're talking about how we violate ourselves by uh, engaging in thoughts, in speech, and in actions that harm others and harm ourselves. And um, in exploring the issue of integrity, I've seen, you know, integrity has a pretty fragile edge. And uh, it, I think it's interesting to look at that edge. Um, uh, one of the things that has uh, come to my attention through my own personal experience, but also by coming alongside so many others, um, is that often it takes uh, an experience of moral anguish or a push or a slip over the edge uh, of integrity, where we fall into, if you will, um, the abyss of suffering. And um, as a result of that, uh, that experience, um, we begin this process of uh, we you know we we suffer so much, we begin to look at you know what are my values? What is really important here? What do I care about? What is the purpose of my life? I think that most of us who come to practice um, have come because uh, of suffering, suffering because of uh, we witness the suffering of others or we ourselves have gone through. Uh, the experience of suffering. Now, it takes a lot of moral sensitivity uh, in order to uh, detect when we have gone over the edge. And um, it also takes moral discernment, you know, which is our uh, ability to actually assess um, what actions are morally justifiable and this is where practice is really important. You know, I use, for example, the image of strong back, which is the development of equanimity. It's an embodied image. And soft front, which is the development of compassion, understanding that equanimity and compassion are two sides of the same coin. And one of the things that equanimity lends us is the capacity to perceive deeply, to see reality more clearly in a more balanced way without interference from the biases um, that give rise to our opinions, um, to our judgments. And uh, this is really critical that we have that kind of uh, equanimity. But also moral sensitivity means that we are able to expand our subjectivity. Um, to actually include the experience of others and to be able to really read our surround. So we're looking at these, this combination of two features, moral sensitivity and the capacity for moral discernment. So our work, I believe, um, is you know, in the medium of practice, but it's also our practice is affirmed through living by vow. And I believe that living by vow is central to our integrity. And that's um, our ability to be guided by our deepest values and to uh, be able to uh, connect to who we really are and to be conscientious, to care and to be careful. And it also points toward um, when we live by vow, um, our capacity to be morally sensitive. And um, uh, this is you know, something that I think is uh, essential if we were to develop uh, what is called uh, moral character. So I've identified four different uh, ways uh, that one can go off course in relation to uh, integrity. And um, I've you know, lumped these four processes or experiences under the rubric of moral suffering. And so moral suffering uh, can be defined as the harm we experience in relation to actions that transgress the tenets of basic human goodness. 
And I first want to talk about um, moral distress. We're going to go over four different forms of moral suffering. But the first I want to speak to is moral distress. And moral distress arises uh, when we become aware of a moral problem and um, we want to determine a remedy. We want to, uh, uh, and, and we probably do determine a remedy. We see a way through uh, the difficulty, but actually we're unable to act on it because of internal or external constraints. So since I interact with many clinicians, um, this issue of uh, moral distress is really up in relation to what's being experienced now uh, in the pandemic. For example, uh, the allocation of uh, sufficient resources to protect the clinicians, but also to take care of the patients. Are there enough beds? The clinician, clinician knows this person needs a bed, but there aren't enough beds in the ICU. So they put the patient in the hallway of the emergency room, experiencing moral distress because not being able to do the best for the person who is so gravely ill. The second area that uh, I've identified in the, under the rubric of moral suffering is moral injury. And this is a psychological wound that results from witnessing or participating in a morally transgressive act. Now, moral injury has been primarily identified in the military. Um, more and more research in the area of uh, moral injury is coming out now in relation to uh, men and women who have been in combat and who have witnessed uh, acts of violence or participated in acts of violence that have caused them, you know, really in, in, to, their values feel compromised, violated, and they experience a kind of fundamental transgression of uh, their character. And the result of uh, moral injury is this sense of guilt, of, uh, of uh, self-blame, of profound shame, and uh, it has been determined that you know, many of the suicides uh, experienced in the military are probably arising out of the experience of moral injury. This is a very important area for us to explore because it also touches those in medicine. It also touches politicians and educators, and it touches parents moral injury, a psychological wound resulting from witnessing or participating in a morally transgressive act. I mean, it's basically a toxic, festering mix of dread, of guilt, and of shame. Moral outrage is the third area that I've uh, written about and identified. Um, you know, it's an externalization of the expression of indignation toward uh, others who have violated social norms. And recently I saw a very interesting uh, comment by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, which I, I think is, is uh, important to take note of. Um, what His Holiness was suggesting uh, is that um, a, a dose of moral outrage is not bad. And I would tend to agree that it is a kind of wake-up call. Um, it is uh, uh, a combination of anger about the violation of uh, you know, our basic humanity. It's a sense of, uh, of uh, self-righteousness. Um, it's the experience of indignation. So there's anger, but there's also disgust. Now, so this is very interesting, and this has been mapped out by neuroscientists, the areas of the brain associated with the expression 
of moral outrage include uh, disgust. And disgust arises because one's survival feels threatened, just as you would smell, for example, uh, the odor coming off of a, a cadaver who is rotting and feel you know, fundamental disgust, a sense of deep revulsion. Moral outrage um, is uh, made up also of this same uh, sense of disgust in relation to uh, unethical actions that uh, are engaged in where we want people to be accountable and um, we uh, demand justice. But you know, moral uh, injury, just going back a few steps, it's important to feel bad when you've harmed others. So, you know, it's not all bad. Moral distress also is not all bad. You know, it's important to feel distress when you cannot actualize uh, a good path uh, for the well being of another. But when moral injury or moral distress or moral uh, outrage become chronic, that is the issue. The fourth area that I want to address is called moral apathy. And this occurs when people simply don't care to know or when they're in denial about the situations that harm them. For example, um, the bubble of privilege that many people in the midst of this pandemic, you know, who have education, who have wealth, who have status are able to protect themselves from the effects of the pandemic. But although your president didn't and my president didn't, so, you know, there's no uh, 100%. But nonetheless, this sort of bubble of privilege that many individuals um, live in. But also another bubble is the bubble of addiction. Moral apathy arises um, when uh, addiction is driving our life, whether it's to uh, our lifestyle, to status, uh, to sexuality, to drugs, um, to the very medium that we're on right now, to the internet, to our social media, and so forth. And uh, any of these uh, experiences, be they moral distress, moral injury, Moral uh, outrage or moral apathy get, can give rise to complete moral disengagement. So, you know, what can we do in order to um, address uh, the experience of moral suffering that uh, might have touched our lives? And um, I think one of the most important things is the medium of practice, our practice, our capacity to stop, to look deeply, to discern, to see the truth of impermanence, to acknowledge that there is no uh, inherent and separate self, but then from the point of view of compassion, um, we have an imperative to, uh, in the cultivation of bodhicitta, to actually address the suffering of others and to um, bring our attention to the truth of suffering in the world and not turn away from it. And thus um, uh, to expand, if you will, the circle of our inquiry to include uh, the wider and wider world, including um, you know, the rainforest of the Amazon, including the atmosphere that we breathe, to understand that our very consumerism um, is contributing to the climate catastrophe to see that we are our atmosphere without it we will not survive that we are uh, deeply connected with the uh, rainforests of the amazon that the amazon river is a uh, earth vein um, that is the repository of uh, deep life so expanding uh, our circle of inquiry and coming into what Thich Nhat Hanh has called interbeing or interconnectedness. The next thing that I think is really critical and it's related to the, the previous, which is you know, deep practice, realization, non-duality, non-separation, but not bypassing, is living by vow to uh, actualize or instantiate 
bring into our deep marrow the uh, value and the lived experience of our precepts. And this means to uh, uh, be diligent about not harming and to revere all life, to see all life is sacred, even the lives of those who harm others. You know, inside that person's life is also a Buddha. And to practice fundamental generosity of heart and of mind, and also of our actions, and not to steal people's energy, and not to call the natural world a resource that can be exploited. It's not a resource. It's our very life. And then to engage in conduct that um, is deeply respectful and that is uh, you know, characterized by love and commitment. And most difficult for so many of us is to engage in speech that is fundamentally healing, not bypassing, but learning to speak deeply and truthfully and constructively. And then uh, finally, this is the five precepts, just you know, a gloss on them, but is you know, is to avoid intoxicants, including the intoxicants of the internet, um, the intoxicants of sexuality, the intoxicants of riches, and so forth. So um, you know, I want to finish this uh, uh, talk um, with. Uh, it's something that I wrote in um, my book, Standing at the Edge. I'm very happy it's coming out in Portuguese. And uh, if I can just share this uh, little piece that I wrote uh, to conclude uh, my talk today. There is a Japanese practice called Kintsukuroi, meaning golden repair. Kintsukuroi is the art of repairing broken pottery with powdered gold or platinum mixed with lacquer so that the repair reflects the history of breakage. The, repair, the repaired object mirrors the fragility and imperfection of life and also its beauty and strength. The object returns to wholeness through the repair, it returns to integrity. Then I write, I'm not suggesting that we should seek brokenness as a way of strengthening integrity. Although some cultures do pursue crisis in their rites of passage as a way to develop character and open the heart. Rather, I'm proposing that the wounds and harms that arise from falling over the edge into moral suffering can have positive value under the right circumstances. Moral distress, the pain of moral injury and outrage, and even the numbness of moral apathy can be the means for the golden repair, for developing a greater capacity to stand firm in our integrity without being swayed by the wind. And I conclude over my years of traveling to Japan, I've held several of these exquisitely restored vessels in my hands. I've seen that the golden repair is not a hidden repair. It shows clearly a vessel's undisguised damage. It combines ordinary stuff and precious metals to repair the crack, but not hide it. This is, I believe, how moral transformation happens and integrity opens, not by rejecting suffering, but by incorporating the suffering into a stronger material, the material of goodness, so that the broken parts of our nature, our society, and our world can meet in the gold of wholeness. So I finish this talk, I hope uh, on time, just with uh, the, the prayer, um, just as what happened in uh, South Africa and in various other countries that um, we come into uh, the experience of healing through truth and through reconciliation. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Roshi Halifax. Please uh, join me in thanking Roshi Halifax and our digital ways um, in the times of Zoom. And uh, so we can just imagine an applause right now. <laughs> Great. So I'd like to now invite Lama Santem to join us. And I know many people here uh, are well familiar with Lama Santem, but for those who are not, uh, Lama Santem is of course the uh, guiding figure of the SEBI communities in Brazil. He was formerly a professor of physics for many years and a leading voice of uh, environmentalism in Brazil as well. And so I think that uh, there's some wonderful connections perhaps between the work of, uh, of, of, our, of our two guests today. So Lama Santam, can I invite you to uh, go ahead and take it away? It was really great, your speech. I think you, you brought wonderful ideas. And uh, I would ask you to say some words for the young people who now feel that maybe they will not have a future. In this moment, they have this uh, challenge of imagine what could happen for them, uh, what, uh, what is this world that they are engaging now. There is absolutely, I believe, no way we can know um, what the future will be, but we can be in this moment, <clears throat> this very moment. And we can also have the sense of uh, love and care arising uh, in this moment that makes it possible for us to um, have the confidence to create a the future that we feel is most beneficial for as many beings as possible. And I, this is why I think, you know, again, um, uh, this sensibility of presence and also of the present. We have now, now is the time for us to actualize uh, the promise of the future, um, not tomorrow. And falling into futility is in a way a kind of cop-out, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot depends not only um, on uh, uh, young people, you know, we uh, elders uh, have a responsibility um, to actually uh, change uh, our own behaviors um, so that we're modeling, you know, the best for young people. I can't separate young people from elders because you know, it's not like young people are living in this vacuum and elders are living here. Um, we share a common world. And we have a common responsibility. And I feel like the elders, you know, in a way, my generation has made so many grave errors. And this is why um, I ended my talk uh, bringing into focus the process of truth and reconciliation. It is, I feel, our responsibility to uh, be very clear and to, uh, you know, to apologize to the younger generation and yes. then to form relationships that are generative so we can build the future together. Yes, thank you. And um, I would like you to hear you to address the, um, the question of collective views. For example, uh, when we press, usually we are invited to develop personal views, to develop uh, a way that is, in some sense, is a personal way. But, uh, for example, when we change the mind, uh, it often we, um, we feel that the world uh, doesn't understand the new positions. Even, for example, if we change the way of eating, then uh, maybe we don't find the, the things we want to, to eat. Um, for, for example, organic food. It may be not easy. Then we are in a world that we, we don't have really a um, possibility of uh, individually change the things. 
for example, any person in a big city, when go to the bathroom, doesn't know what will happen uh, with the uh, with the water, the flux. And uh, then we are in a, in a net, in a, in, a, in a tight net with all the people. Then we need to change uh, collective thinking, collective way of thinking. And how Buddhism can help in this? So, um, gosh, you asked uh, many questions, uh, you know, uh, within uh, what you said. Mm. So, uh, okay. you know, maybe you could ask me just, you know, there, there were so many wonderful things that you said, and maybe you can just ask me one question out of the, <laughs> all the questions that, that were embedded in what you shared. Okay. Um, how to help the people to, uh, to change collectively the, the way of, uh, of uh, living. So one of the things that um, I've learned uh, from experience is that, you know, I can't really do this for anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, I have to take responsibility for my life, for my practice, and uh, my willingness to mm -hmm. actually um, relate to the world in a conscientious way. But um, there's another part here, and that is that um, I'm observed by others just as young people observe each other. And as a result of that, um, you know, a whole sort of wave of values and of behaviors arise that could be wholesome or unwholesome. And so, uh, although we are only responsible for, you know, our practice, so to speak, uh, the transformation yeah. of our own mental continuum, um, mm -hmm. Just by doing so, we are touching uh, numberless other beings. So I think this is really one of the profound values of having a contemplative practice, that um, we stop. We learn to actually concentrate, to allocate our attention to the breath, mm -hmm. for example, shamatha, mm -hmm. shine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We begin to settle down. And as a result of that, we can see more deeply in, into also the truth of our own suffering, seeing our delusions and biases in going through the struggle of feeling like, you know, I'm worthless, I'm stupid, I'm harmful and so forth. Mm -hmm. But also seeing, you know, the truth of impermanence and looking deeply that we are not separate from the external world, that it's a continuum, yes. that our subjectivity, when we drop deeply into practice is radically inclusive of all beings and things. Mm -hmm. So one better know where your uh, toilet water is going. <laughs> Does it go into the Amazon River? Yeah. That is what mindfulness is, but it's also what is the actualization of the precepts. We have to know things in terms of karma or of cause and effect. And to understand yes. that our thinking, mm -hmm. you know, and our behaviors can have uh, radically uh, destructive or constructive downstream effects and take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> um, in, in this time, we are receiving different masters from different uh, uh, ethnic Buddhism, uh, and we, we have seen this, you are seeing this in the United States, here in Brazil, and said, what do you feel, do you feel that will happen? Uh, how is it going to work? Because uh, each lineage have its own values and perspectives. And sometimes we, sometimes we need to to address also the challenges of the society, the present society. How do you feel in this mm -hmm. question? I know that you uh, easily go from different uh, approaches and you can uh, easily understand and uh, discuss with different people of different lineages. Well, 
You know, I so appreciate what His Holiness the Dalai Lama says again and again. He said there are 84,000 Dharma doors. Mm. So, you know, each lineage is an upaya. It's a skillful means. It's a prescription of a particular kind. You know, I just know in Buddhism, um, of the, the various Tibetan schools, but also the Theravadan lineage and also Zen, uh, the different schools that we have, that, um, you know, my own uh, lineage is not for everybody. Tibetan Buddhism is not for everybody, um, but we share something in common. And what we share is the commitment uh, that the Buddha actualized in the first turning of the wheel, which is the understanding, looking deeply into the truth of suffering and the origins of suffering, and that we can actually free ourselves from suffering, and there's a path. Now, all of the lineages, is, uh, all of them share that, uh, this common root, but there are different ways, um, which I think is wonderful. Uh, making it possible for, you know, someone who has this kind of personality and a tendency, they will fit better into the Vajrayana school, the Nyingma school. Others mm -hmm. will fit better into the Soto Zen school. Mm -hmm. But I feel like our common humanity and being a citizen of this earth, one of many Wonderful. species, unites us. Mm -hmm. I'm not a sectarian. I just think that sectarianism, I remember something, Lama Samtin. Um, yeah. Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, I practiced yeah. with him a number of years ago, and he said, do not ba be bound to any doctrine, theory, or ideology. Um, all systems of thought are guiding means. They are not absolute truth. So I, you yes. know, I, I loved it. This is, you know, the old version of the precept when I was practicing with Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated that uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, uh, yeah, but one <clears throat> more thing, Lama Sampton, you know, in the name of religion, I believe that there's been more harm than in the name of real estate. <laughs> <laughs> I think religion has caused a lot of suffering in this world. Yes, so, that's right. You know, we have to keep our yes. vows right in front of us. Yes. And um, about uh, uh, Soto Zen, how do you feel this? Uh, how the teachings of uh, Dogen Zen G can uh, survive in these times? It looks like um, uh, uh, something that brings us outside of the world, in some sense. Well, what is very curious is that the teachings of Dogen Zenji are um, more and more accessed. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. more and more books have been yes. written about Dogen than ever, yes. you know, in the history since uh, his death in 1253. <laughs> And your, our good mutual friend, Kazuaki Tanahashi, you know, is uh -huh. part of the wave um, of uh, uh, individuals who are writing uh, texts and translating uh, about Dogen and translating Dogen. You know, for me, uh, Dogen's emphasis on uh, shikantaza, on just mm -hmm. sitting, um, a mm -hmm. natural mind, uh, uncontrived, unmediated by uh, the process of techniques. Um, that is actually what I think is so powerful about uh, the work of Dogen. You know, the volumes that he wrote all point to, you know, this very simple thing. Just, it's mm -hmm. called, you know, uh, Dokan, the circle of the way, the integration. Mm -hmm. Of, um, of sitting, of uh, precepts, of realization, and this life as it is. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, when a student of uh, um, Kaz Tanahashi is translating, is starting to translate the, the teachings of Dogen Zenji, uh, I think it's wonderful. Um, for me, uh, it's very special, really, 
in Buddhism. It's the uncommon, the approach of uh, Dogen. I think um, any person in any lineage can really appreciate and uh, enlarge the, his view with the perspective of Dogen. One point that... Well, I, uh, I admire yes. the person who's translating uh, Dogen, probably from Kaz's text in English uh -huh. into, um, uh, you know, Portuguese. Uh, you know, uh, Dogen is very uh, um, inaccessible. I mean, in, in a certain way, um, you, you have to kind of marinate yourself in Dogen, you know, like you would mm. marinate a, a vegetable, uh, marinate uh -huh. uh, an aubergine, you know, you have to let Dogen kind of soak slowly into you. Yes, of course. Yes, essentially all Buddhism is that like, because it's very profound and uh, we have to understand what is really sad in the Dogen especially. <laughs> Um, one point that uh, I think uh, is very interesting for me, uh, with the challenge also, is the meaning of uh, that the old trunk uh, suddenly uh, show flowers and it uh, uh, brings the the spring. I, I yeah, appreciate uh, I appreciate very much these figures he used because. I understand that this as the changing of the world, really. When the, the view change, when we see the flower, the view change. When the view change, the spring comes. And then and I th course, think we... Uh, yes. I mean, spring is always, you know, uh, associated with the experience of awakening, with bud, with Buddha, mm -hmm. with what it is to awaken. Yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful. Yes, Dogen, like uh, many of the great uh, Chan masters in uh, early China, uses um, uh, poetical imagery in order to mm -hmm. transmit the Dharma. So, you mm -hmm. know, I remember George Dreyfus once said, you know, uh, Christians love God and Buddhists love lists. So, you know, there's quite a few schools of Buddhism, mm -hmm. both Theravada and, of course, uh, Vajrayana where you know the lists are really wonderful you know there's a great uh, way to remember uh the the dharma but in zen the emphasis is not so much on lists but on uh, the evocation of one's experience uh through poetic imagery mm -hmm. yeah. i don't know if we have some time for a last question uh, maybe you could help us to understand with your experience um, what to do, for example, uh, when we are approaching elections, uh, the Sangha started to ask, should we vote here or that? <laughs> and they, they, they bring the question, they, they they bring uh, opposition, they, they, they look at the people as devil or as good persons or other as uh, very bad images. And, uh, they, they think they have to fight against. And uh, how do you feel this? Well, I think this is a very powerful opportunity in your country, my country and various other countries in the mm -hmm. world um, where we see the, you know, corruption in politics and also the effects mm -hmm. of corruption, particularly on mm -hmm. people who are, um, uh, don't have access to uh, medical care or who are impoverished mm -hmm. or have uh, no access to education or, or, you know, the exploitation of natural resources and the climate mm -hmm. effects of this. So, you know, I try to vote with my heart. I really do. No, I, you yeah. know, I say, where, where is the least harm and the most good going to fall? Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, it's not about liking or disliking. It really, I try to use the medium of my practice as a way to um, bring forward uh, my discernment to, um, and, and, and my commitment to end suffering. And where will uh, the least suffering and the most good, who will yes carry that Good. and whom can i hold accountable 
So, you know, we have been, Lama Sampton, very active in our community and also um, through Zoom all over the world in our Maha Sangha around mm -hmm. political and climate issues. I, we've been mm -hmm. unabashedly uh, involved <laughs> where many Buddhists are, you know, no, that you're not to do this. I'm an old social activist. I've been at this since 1965 and I am not yeah. stopping now. And somebody asked about not voting. Not voting is voting. So let me just say, if you don't <laughs> yes. vote, that means, you know, you're, yes. you can't do that. That's bypassing. Take a stand, participate in your society. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Then, uh, I think we this are. Is it. It's a, Thank you yes, so that's it. much. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you. My pleasure. Please uh, join my me pleasure. to the point we can in thanking both Roshi Halifax and Lama Santan with our wonderful digital tools. <laughs> Great. So thank, thank you. you both so much. That's uh, I certainly didn't expect that we'd get into the ins and outs of Dogen today, but I guess it just goes to show that we never know what to expect. And, well, I uh, thank Lama Santin for that. <laughs> thank you, Roshi. <laughs> if you talk to Lama Santin for five minutes, I think Dogen will show up at some point. <laughs> so um, please uh, join me again in uh, thanking Roshi for joining us, Roshi Halifax. She's at 9,000 feet in the mountains of New Mexico now. And you can see she's wearing quite a bit of clothes. It's getting cold. And she's joining us mm -hmm. by satellite. And like a good Zen person, she's been up since four in the morning. So uh, thank you so much for being with us today. May your Great. life go well and honored. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, please watch out for the uh, launching of, of Roshi's book. And uh, I think a lot of people, maybe some people know that uh, the beginning of SEBI talks is also the beginning of the SEBI college, the uh, yet to be named college, mm -hmm. which uh, is bringing young people into these conversations. And I think uh, trying to do many of the things that were discussed now. And so I'd like to invite the the, the 20 uh, students, uh, 10 from the US and 10 from Brazil, to uh, go ahead and join us in about five minutes on the second link. And Roshi Halifax, uh, I'd like uh, to uh, invite you to join us as well. And, but most okay, of all, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for everyone who's uh, joined us today, that it's, uh, it's coming together and speaking and listening and hearing and digesting and marinating and all this good stuff where I think that uh, we, we have some grist for a, a better future. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone next month. And so one thank you again for Roshi Halifax. Thank you, Roshi.